Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Double Down with Breslow, where we bring you yet another great guest from the sports betting industry. Uh, we have today Joseph Martin, who's going to cover a subject that we haven't covered yet, but it's a really important element of the gaming business, and that's money laundering. Uh, the gaming business for a long time has been used by money launderers, and uh, it's, for the most part, an obligation of operators to to check for money laundering and, and make sure that they are paying attention and reporting money laundering. So Joseph Martin has a great new tool for that. His company is called Connectify. Joseph, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's great to be here. So, and, and I know you guys aren't just about money laundering. It's also primarily about, you know, player behavior. So there's a lot of things that you can find out about how players are playing and why they're playing the way they're playing. So there's a lot of stuff we'll get into, but let's, let's start with money laundering uh, and just talk about it, broadly speaking, as a problem in the gaming business historically. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, m money laundering is a big, is, is really a big topic. Right. When you think about money laundering, it is, you know, cleaning your money to facilitate all kinds of different types of nefarious activity. And so that could range from just cleaning your money. Right. Or it could be there is uh, all kinds of like human trafficking that's involved. There can be sex trafficking. There there is there is a wide range of different types of criminal activity that touch this space. Right. If you generate lot, 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 lots of illicit funds from fraudulent activities, then you would need to clean that money to get into the banking system and be able to use it, right? And so casinos are often, have been historically often targeted um, as organizations that process a lot of transactions. And there's a lot of different ways to conduct activities in a gaming organization. And so it's it's been attractive to to people involved with this type of criminal activity to misuse the services of a gaming organization to to run money through the organization uh, gaming organizations are are licensed and they fall under the bank secrecy act and there's a lot of regulation around that uh, the bsa the us patriot act uh, I, irs is the primary regulator examiner over over the gaming industry and so for a long time, historically, gaming organizations have, they have cared about this issue and they've dedicated human resources to this issue, but there hasn't been a lot of technology in this space um, until very recently. And so they've really struggled with like single point solutions, really narrow scope solutions, out of date uh, type software solutions. And they've had to throw a lot of human resources and labor um, and so you might have these larger organizations and you're talking about 7 million plus active players and 50 million players in their database, right? A large casino organization and moving over a billion transactions a year. And even if you staff up to like some of the, the largest program I've ever heard of in gaming is like 90 AML professionals, right? And if you have this large staff, you're still, it's just a drop in the bucket right? Of what you're able to look at. Uh, when I was at Caesars Entertainment and I was an AML analyst there, we had, they dedicated a lot of resources to compliance and we had an investigation. And, and, and to be team. clear, they had a, they have a legal obligation to be looking for this. Is that right? And, and, and if so, where does that legal obligation come from? Yeah, absolutely. So the legal obligation really comes from the Bank Secrecy Act, which has been around for a long time started in the 70s on the Nixon administration, and it's evolved over time. Um, and then that was reinforced by the U.S. Patriot Act and other laws and regulations. Uh, and so they have a legal obligation to not facilitate criminal activity, right? And they're held accountable for that. You see large fines, people can get their license revoked. It's not only in the U.S., internationally, you see issues in Australia right now with, with gaming organizations getting their licenses revoked uh, because of this issue. And so uh, I think the U.S. was really aggressive on AML re regulation early on. Um, and then and then you see the EU in 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 other organization in other international bodies in, in other foreign government organizations uh now regulating it really stringently. And, and and walk us through how someone or some entity launders money through a gaming company. How, how would they do that or how, how have they done that? There's a lot of methodologies and the methodologies really evolve 
and they have evolved over time. And so some of the methodologies that are pretty common or uh, there's di different types of analysis that you'll look at, like maybe people walking out with large volumes of chips out of a brick and mortar casino, right? Like, why would you do that, right? You could use chips as a currency, right? Or coming into a casino and you don't know where this large volume of chips came from, right? From a player. Uh, there's different types, right? From a player. Uh, there's different types of like minimal gaming is, is things people look at where uh, maybe you're wiring large sums of money into the casino and you have a lot in, in your account at the casino or online gaming organization. And, and then you're not playing, you're not risking very much money. And then you're wiring that money back out, right? Uh, or transferring that money back out. And so there's different, there's a lot of different methodologies or methods and those things evolve over time. Um, but the core obligation is to be on the lookout for those things and to be able to identify those things. And to do that, it's a lot of data, right? It's, it's all, all the details of the players and all their biographic information and every transaction that happens and the time and date stamps of those transactions and all the different metadata associated with that. Well, let me ask you about that the, the, the data because everything is about data these days and it wasn't in the past, you know, yeah, so if absolutely. you just envision, you're just watching the movie Casino and thinking about 1970s Vegas and, and what it was like then, and it was pretty much all a cash business, cash and co lots of coins and cash. But even today, um, you know, you sit down at a blackjack table in Vegas, you're putting down cash for the most part. I mean, it maybe you could tell me, maybe the high rollers are all on credit, and but, but you know, most people are gonna sit down and, and put out cash and you play through your cash a bit and then when you cash out you're going to be given a bunch of a bunch of chips so you know what how is that data even being collected and is that even an example of of a way that people would would money launder at a blackjack table? yeah so like with a brick and mortar casino there's a lot of ways to conduct transactions right and and, and to play there's a lot of different games there's a lot of methods to bring money into the casino to bring money out of the casino and not just that but really your player behavior at the casino, right? And so some of the data is like handwritten, right? With pit bosses, like monitoring what's going on at the table, right? So some of the data, you know, is not a, as reliable as, as you would want it, right? And, and those are problems to be solved um, over time. And some of them are just maybe not even that solvable, right? Because it's just the way that casinos are set up and the way that games are played. And so, um, that is an issue in some areas. Um, other areas, very transparent. Like you walk up to a cage and you're and you're and you're you know converting cash to chips and doing wire transfers and everything and and everything you're doing there is is it's all recorded, right? And so it just kind of depends where you're at the casino and what game you're playing and what that transaction looks like to be able to kind of assess the quality of that data. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day. The data is going into the system, right? And once the data is in the system, it's within your universe of knowledge and you're held accountable for that. So the let, government- let, let me just walk you through that scenario just because I'm just curious when you talk about the data that yeah. goes into the system. So a guy goes to the cage and says, you know, I'd like $5,000 worth of chips, right? Mm -hmm. So that transaction is going to be completed relatively simply. The guy hands him $5,000 cash and gets $5,000 chips. Yeah, there's cage management software. There's okay. different software that is used throughout the casino um, at the cage and in the pits and, and in different areas. The slots machines, you know, record everything that you're doing on the machine, right? So now, so he's, now he's got the $5,000 in chips, mm -hmm. but how does the casino track what he then does with those chips as far as playing with them and then coming back to the cage and saying, okay, now I've got $4,800 gee, I lost 200 bucks, but, you know, cash me out, please. Yeah. So everyone has a player ID, right? And so every transaction at the casino is recorded. And, and so a lot of it. Well, deducted. hold on. When you say everyone has a player ID, what, what do you mean by that? You, you're talking about a player card or because not everybody has a player card, right? Yeah, that's right. So anyone, I guess, I, I guess I should more accurately say anyone that passes a certain triggering event or a threshold. Uh, will have a player ID once they have an ID, right? And they have a player card, then transactions are tracked against that 
that that player ID and that player card. Assuming they, they like use to call it a rated play. Right? But if they, and, but right, but if they choose not to use it, which I, if I'm a money launderer, I don't want to be tracked, right? So I don't want my points. Thank you very much for the free breakfast, right? right? So. Right. You know, so I'm walking around and I'm playing at the tables and I'm not putting down a card, which, you know, half of the people don't put down a card. Yeah, so there there is a universe of data that where where people don't have player IDs and they might not have player cards, right? And with that, there are um, certain patterns like bill stuffing and other and other types of patterns that you're 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 looking at where you're notifying uh, the hosts and you're notifying the people in the cage um to to collect that information right and when people hit certain thresholds there's different types like if you get a line of credit if you're going to get markers if you're going to get like if you're going to um if you're going to pass a certain transaction threshold whatever they set that at it's five thousand dollars three thousand dollars ten thousand dollars depends on the gaming organization their policies uh they're they're required then to collect that information from you and issue you a player card and player id and your players in, in your players tract. So when you're talking about money laundering, it would take a very sophisticated, very large organization to be able to move a significant money uh, amount of money through a casino with microtransactions, right? Uh, as soon as you start hitting larger thresholds, then then they're collecting information on you. So then after that, it once they collect the information on you, it's it's gaming the system, right? Uh, to find out how can I do these transactions undetected? And in the past, there hasn't been uh, as uh, sophisticated monitoring software to be able to look over these billions of transactions, right, and to be able to detect these patterns. So it's been uh, historically maybe a little easier uh, than in banking and other industries to be able to move money uh, around in a casino and be able to conduct these types of activities. But uh, that's rapidly changing now. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, so so back to my example, if the guy's walking around without a player card or not playing with a player card, probably that would be a red flag, right? So, so there's yeah, a, what you're saying is on a casino floor, there's a big human element to it. Um, I guess another point yeah. you're making is that, yeah, if you're talking about smaller dollars, maybe it's not terribly difficult to launder smaller dollars. It is harder to catch that. But what is most concerning to casinos and ultimately regulators, I would think is is the larger dollars, which you know you're, you're saying basically larger dollars are going to be tracked on the system and therefore able to be monitored by your system, right? Yeah, and it's just not lar larger single transactions, but it's an aggregation, right? You're aggregating transactions over a period of time. When you hit thresholds, then that player is, becomes in, in the rate of play, right? They 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 they, they get an ID, you get a player card. And then all their activity is tracked. And the casino is using that for a lot of different ways, right? There's marketing and they're incentivized to be able to, to you have comps and you have all this marketing and all this other stuff that casinos really care about. And so there's a great incentive for them to encourage people and incentivize them to, to become within, you know, to have a player ID and, and to have their activity tracked in this way. Yeah. All right. Well, we got to take our, our one and only break. Um, we'll be back after the break and we'll talk about money laundering, particularly related to sports betting, since that's what this show is about. And I also want to know about uh, what we're seeing out there as far as who is out there laundering money through the casino. We're talking to Joseph Martin, CEO of Connectify. We will be back with more after the break. Hi, everyone. I'm Veronica Dudo, and welcome to Buy, Hold, Sell. If you have the Russians that are going into Ukraine, the Americans and the Germans and everyone else in Europe is going to say, hell no. If Russia doing things, you know, logically was their M.O., I'd agree with you. Yeah, Todd, why don't you get him on, on a phone call right now? Hello, <laughs> you... Financial News TV, just the way you like it. Fast-paced, unadulterated. In your face, rock and roll style. Join us next time on Buy, Hold, Sell Live. Oh, yeah, I'm going to remember all that. I can't even remember. Oh, God. Yeah, well, that doesn't. I want you to. Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> Fast pace. No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Take one. <laughs> Fast pace. No holds barred. In your face, rock and roll style. Woohoo! Good sign. Let's kick some ass.
And welcome back, everybody, to Double Down with Presslow. We are talking to Joseph Martin, founder and CEO of Connectify, a SaaS uh, software application that can be used by gaming companies to help track money laundering. Um, and I wanted I want to talk specifically about sports betting, but before I do, uh, give us an idea of what you guys are seeing out there when it comes to money laundering. Who? What kind of criminal enterprises? are the primary money launderers that we're catching in the casino space? I think a really important aspect of that question is, is, is really technology, right? You have these large universes of data, right? That these gaming organizations have, and they're siloed in different systems in different places. And it's a challenge to bring all that data together and to look at it, right? Even if you have a massive labor force looking at it, if they're using mainly Excel spreadsheets and access databases and, and outdated technology, it's really difficult to see those patterns and those trends. And so what we're seeing right now is gaming organizations modernizing their own internal systems so they can connect with SaaS companies like us, like more modern companies that can provide them analytical tools, not just for anti-money laundering, but really all areas of their operations. So you're seeing this like revolution in 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 the in the gaming industry from brick and mortar casinos even small casinos all the way up to the largest commercial casinos and online gaming companies really modernizing their data stacks and be able to pull in companies like connectify that can provide analytics visibility case management you know reporting to the US government and and with that now we're starting to see uh more trends right? A lot of it's like the same stuff that we've always been aware of, right? Gaming has been around for a while and, and, and we know different types of nefarious activity. And so a lot of it's detecting uh, uh, more, more effectively that activity across a system of casinos. One thing that Connectify does that uh, that's really unique is that we can connect multiple properties into one single view. So if I'm sitting at MGM or I'm sitting at Caesars Entertainment, now I can see what James is doing across all of my properties and the trends and the patterns that it's conducting. And that's never been done before in gaming. And so it's a very exciting time for gaming to be able to modernize. And the next step is going to be applying artificial intelligence to that. And that's where it's going to really address your question, right? If we talk from a year from now, right? And we have 20, 30, 50 billion, you know, uh, transactions in the database, and then we're scanning those transactions and looking for patterns and using data science and using very advanced artificial intelligence. We're going to see new patterns and trends and be able to stay in front of criminal activity, where historically it might take you two or three years and millions of dollars that were laundered to be able to identify a new pattern or a trend. Now it can be immediate and instantaneous. Mm -hmm. Is it sometimes the government going to the casinos and basically saying that, hey, we think this is going on at your casino? We need you to. To look into this it's really a human intelligence exercise you kind of honed in on this earlier um and i thought that was really impressive that you're able to pick pick that out and it's basically what happens is like in banking you don't spend your money at the bank that's the biggest difference and why banking providers struggle when they try to come into the gaming sector is anti-money laundering and anti-money laundering analysis has happened in banking for like over 20 years right since 9-11 it's been a focus counter-terrorist finance anti-money laundering and all of these things right um, but the big difference is you don't spend your money at the bank. You spend it out in the real world and all the bank sees is the in and out transaction. And so you're looking at deposits and withdrawals, basically what it comes down to, right? In gaming, it's different. You're spending money on the FanDuel app or on the DraftKings app, right? And you're interacting with the game. At a brick and mortar casino, you're walking around the facility and you're interacting with the game. So there's all this human intelligence, right? A dealer knows what looks weird right? And, and having that reporting mechanism where they can just click a few buttons and say, hey, this weird thing happened and file an incident with the compliance office, that color is extremely important because now you have data, you have this additional color, these additional descriptions and narratives, and you start piecing these stories together. And so a lot of it is gaming organizations pulling all this data together, getting it over to the federal government through suspicious activity reporting and all of that. Federal government does some really interesting things where they have these databases across banking and insurance and gaming and all of these uh, industries that are higher risk that uh, fall under the Bank Secrecy Act. Um, and they can aggregate all of these incidents and these reports and they can see patterns and trends across the U.S. 
They also collaborate internationally with other foreign governments uh, where they can do intelligence research on these uh, these these syndicated crime groups that are that that are global, and they rely on, on on this reporting from these industries to be able to do that. So, if we're talking about online sports betting, what would be something that would trigger effectively a red flag for you guys for money laundering? There's a lot of different things that happen in sports betting. I think equal to money laundering is fraud. Right. So it's both for money laundering. Um, you know, a huge analysis would be things like minimal gaming, like how much are you risking, how much are you playing on the app. It makes sense if you're on there playing and you get a big win and you're like, I'm not going to risk anymore. I'm good. Right. Uh, but it might make less sense if you're playing with hundreds of thousands of dollars and you're not like betting anything. Right. And then you're transferring that money out to your bank or, or wherever else. Right. So there's a lot of different types of typologies and methodologies and, and different things that and methods that, that that we look at and patterns. Um, but a lot of it is really providing visibility into uh, the player history. Like, are there certain months out of the year that they play really heavy? Cause maybe they're really into uh, the NFL and they want to bet really heavy, you know, sports betting over NFL season, but other seasons they don't play as heavy. And then that behavior all of a sudden changes and they're playing really heavily throughout the year and they're not betting very much and things like that. So a lot of it's really, um, you really set a baseline for what is normal. Uh, first of all, you have to understand patterns of suspicious activity, right? And once you understand that in the universe of the different types of methods of, of money laundering, then what you do is you set a baseline for every individual player. And you need modern technology to do that, right? So if you have 7 million players on DraftKings or, or someone big like that, right? And they're doing... 10 billion transactions a year, right? What you're doing is setting a baseline for every single individual, giving them a profile, giving them a risk score, setting a baseline, and then letting people know when that behavior changes and showing them the patterns and the trends, right? Line graphs, bar graphs, all kind of fancy data, like just simple data analytics where you can just show people patterns of activity. When you're talking fraud, um, there's a lot of fraud that happens. So you might be tracking IP addresses. Like if two people log in, if one person logs in from Florida and from Alaska at the same time, like that might be an issue, right? Um, and so a lot of it's like location and IP addresses and there's, but there's a lot of different ways to conduct fraud in, in, in gaming and gaming companies can be bleeding out quite a lot of money, especially with the promotions that they give to attract new players. What would be an example of fraud? that they have to be on the lookout for? I think a lot of the basis of fraud starts with like good identity verification. Like when you're onboarding your players, like, do you know who they are and are they lying to you? Right. Are they actually who they say they are? Once you have that foundation, I think, you know, like, like I said before, I, IP addresses are really important to understand the location of the play and if it makes sense for that player. And so it's not just, you know, it's not just the, it's not just the regulation. Like it's not just geolocation saying like, are they playing from this one jurisdiction? They're only allowed to play for Cause if they're on like the, a global or, or a, a national wide network, like FanDuel, it might be legal to play in both jurisdictions, but it's the same person playing in both jurisdictions at the same time, which is like an account takeover, right? Like someone hacked into your account um, and, 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 and they're playing, there's a lot of different, but there's a lot of different schemes that that players might use to try to 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 draw money out of the casino. Mm -hmm. but those are just a few. So if uh, in, a, in a hypothetical, a guy deposits twenty five thousand dollars into an account, an online sports betting account, makes a couple small wagers, waits a bit, and then says, "Okay, I'm cashing out." That's mm -hmm. a red flag. It sounds like right. What what would happen next? It's really an investigative case. Right. You have a compliance department, a risk management department, and you'll have AML investigators, AML analysts. And they're, you, you, uh, you know, a technology company like Connectify, we're generating like these red flags, right? This thing happened. And we have, you know, different types of mitigating factors and different types of ways to do this analysis to be able to reduce false positives and say, you know, we're pretty confident that this pattern has emerged that you might want to look at. And then it's really a data presentation, right? For the software company to be able to present to the user, to the AML analyst to say, 
here's the trends, here's the patterns, here's their historical information. Have they been doing different types of things that we're concerned about over a period of time? Or is this a one-off incident? Is this the first time it's happened? We, you know, you provide that context and then it's an investigative case, right? You would open a, a case, you would investigate it. You have to use the U.S. government and the regulations for anti-money learners it says you have to use all available information. So you have to have access to all your data and you're talking about petabytes of data that these, that these gaming companies have. So, so it's about, you know, using modern software to be able to pull that data together, be able to do an investigation, be able to find relevant pieces, material information, and then make a decision. And a lot of times the decisions are twofold. One, do you have an obligation to report it to the federal government, right? Do you have to submit like a suspicious activity report that this thing happened, right? And then using technology to be able to facilitate that process to get that report sent off, right? Within the timelines that, that you're required to by law. So it's but all about the these sec- suspicious activity reports, right? That they submit, and those go to what effectively the FBI, which then determines. Uh, FinCEN. It goes to FinCEN, and okay. there's different federal agencies and government agencies that have access to that information at that time, right? Um, but then the second decision that's equally important is what are you going to do about it as an organization, right? Like, are you going to end your relationship with that player, right? Or Are you going to modify the relationship with that player and just say, look, we're going to set a cap on your wire transfers because we think you're misusing that service or whatever, right? And so you can get really smart and surgical about it. Where in the past, when you didn't have really modern technologies behind it, you would, it's like a blunt force instrument. Like this guy did something bad. We might get in trouble because the federal government doesn't, you know, want to see this type of activity. So we're just going to ban these players. And that's unfortunate because the players might not be, they might be just superstitious. So they're cashing out certain intervals or doing other types of things that look suspicious, but they're really not, right? And so being able to get more surgical and be able to set certain types of limits and be able to monitor play in, in certain ways is, is, a, is a much more effective way to save player relationships, to be able to run your business, to be able to scale your business. Um, and there's modern technology now available to do that. Mm-hmm. I think the other thing that is 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 really critical too is there's a lot of there's a lot of colorful people that like to gamble, right? That like to play, and they're gonna have they're they're gonna have backgrounds, they're gonna have you know things that maybe not might not look the best, right? But it doesn't mean that they're misusing their services, your services, and that they're money laundering, right? And so being able to monitor them to say, hey, these are medium risk people, they 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 do have a color of black. Well, um, background, but the pattern of activity isn't that high risk to us yet, but we need to keep an eye on them. And if that changes, then we're going to take actions then, right? So really the exciting thing about AI and the exciting thing about more advanced, sophisticated behavioral-based algorithms and modern technology is just the fact that you can better manage your player population. Right. And you can monitor things in certain ways and save uh, player relationships and be able to scale your business more effectively. Mm-hmm. Let, let's touch on one thing before I let you go. And that is responsible gaming. You said that that's another thing that your system can be used for as a, as a tool to see if somebody has a gambling problem and that needs some form of intervention. So how do you use your system to know somebody's got a gambling problem? Because it seems to me it's all relative to how much money they've got in their bank account. <laughs> you know, somebody could yep. be losing a lot and consistently losing a lot, but it's Michael Jordan. And so who cares? Yeah. I mean, that's the same problem with money laundering, right? If you got a Michael Jordan guy who likes to play or anyone like that, right. And they really enjoy playing, you know, they might walk out of the casino with a bunch of chips or do something that looks weird, but it's not weird to them, right? A couple hundred thousand dollars, nothing. And then they might show up a week later and play at a different property, right? They travel a lot, right? And so it's really important, like net worth, source of funds, things like that are important. That's why having a strong case management system is so important that you're documenting these reasons why you're making these decisions. This is this is the universe of information I knew at this date. And this is a decision that we made on this date, right? And that you can flag these types of players. that are like, hey, this is a higher volume player. And he's the CEO of like, a company and on the on the board of five more, right? Like he has a discretionary funds be spending like this. And so we're comfortable with that, right? And this is why, right? And so as long as you're doing that, and it's 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 most easy to do that from a single platform where everything's documented and everything's in one place and all your investigations are all together. So when when you think about responsible gaming, it's very similar. It's like you're looking at 
the aspects of their backgrounds, their sources of money and like who they are as a person to understand the risks that they bring to your organization and then the behavior that's being conducted at your organization. How are they spending their money? How are they interacting with your games, right? And then having a strong case management system to say, let's document this stuff, right? And you have risk scoring on every single player for, but those risk scores are looking at like player addiction type of indications, right? And there's a whole, there's a whole industry out there, a whole group of psychologists and psychiatrists and all kinds of people, uh, academics that have studied player addiction for over 20 years, right? And so there's a lot of information of indications of, of, of what might constitute a player addiction. Things like chasing losses is a big one, right? Uh, there's certain types of demographics of the U.S. population that you, you, that you might want to be more sensitive to, like younger males or things like that. Um, and so there's, there's different indicators that you can look for and you, you can build this risk scoring. And then with the people in the red, right, the people that are in trouble and they're losing their houses and like things are really bad things are happening, there's intervention that, 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 that can happen. But what I've heard from gaming executives is this group in the yellow, right? The low risk group, you're not as worried about, they're healthy, right? The group in the red, you're kind of cycling them out of the system, right? You're getting them help and they need to kind of take a break, right? But the people in the yellow that are just looking like they might be starting to develop an addiction, you want to be able to monitor that and to work with them and to help them because you don't want a player to burn out as, as a casino executive, right? You want that player to be having fun and to be able to play for 20 years, 30 years, right? And so it's all about like keeping your player population healthy and, and, and to be able to, and, and it's an entertainment industry and just an, and enable people to have fun and, and, and play the games the way they're intended. Yeah, it's interesting. I just had a thought that, you know, perhaps liquor stores <clears throat> should have a similar obligation to, <laughs> to report <laughs> or pay attention to people who are coming back day after day and buying a new bottle of gin uh, every day. But, but you know, uh, casinos uh, have such an obligation. Joseph, we got to let it there, uh, let it go there. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Joseph Martin, founder, CEO of Connectify. Uh, if you want to check out his company, go to connectify.com com for the spelling of that it'll be in the uh description but if you want to go ahead and tell people the spelling make sure they, they get it right yeah so the k-i-n-e-c-t-i-f-y great uh and i think i'm going to see you in in san diego at the gaming uh the sports betting show there all right thanks for sports yeah all thanks right for having me on thank, thanks for joining and thank you all for watching and listening to double down with russell we'll be back soon with another episode take care everybody. I want you to smash that like button. <laughs> <laughs>